welcome everybody. Um, we have some very exciting news. We're, we're very happy about this. Uh, and we're also very happy to have the high degree of interest of people participating today. Um, so, so thank you. We're, we're very encouraged by this. Uh, my name is Cheryl Forchuk. Um, I am uh, an assi a scientist and assistant director at Lawson Health Research Institute, which is the research arm of the London, Ontario hospitals. I know there's another London. Uh, I'm also the, the uh, Burl and Richard Ivey Research Chair at Parkwood Institute uh, Research, uh, which um, focuses on rehabilitation and recovery. Um, and by background, I am a psychiatric nurse. I'm appointed at Western in the Department of Nursing and Psychiatry and have done a lot of work over the years uh, with people who have mental health uh, concerns, including addiction and substance use, uh, and with people experiencing homelessness. And I will uh, to the next slide. So what we're going to be covering today, um, I, I'm going to give you an introduction, but before we do that, uh, we will have our land acknowledgement, uh, which will come from one of um, my staff members, Courtney Hillier. Uh, we will then uh, be hearing about infection control uh, from Dr. Michael Silverman. And I, I think one of the questions we will be answering is why would a psychiatric nurse and infection control expert be talking about methamphetamine? And I, I think you'll be interested to hear what that has to say. And then very important, uh, we're gonna be hearing from the community perspective and lived, ex lived experience perspective. There will be an opportunity uh, for asking questions. Uh, we will be using the chat function uh, for questions uh, due to the large uh, number of people participating today. Uh, and we will do our best. Uh, we, some of my staff will be looking, uh, research staff will be looking at those questions and try to summarize. Uh, as best uh, we can. Um, we won't be able to be closely monitoring the questions with this many people as we go through the event. And I already mentioned Courtney is one of my staff members. We also uh, have John Serrato, who is the research coordinator, uh, who uh, will be looking at those responses and assisting, and Sarah Husney, who is another research coordinator who is helping uh, manage um, the web, the seminar. Uh, after that, the event ends, but we will be available for the press who may have some questions. Um, Laura Concaves, uh, many, uh, who is in the media relations, uh, will field uh, any assistance that the media needs in following up. On to you, Courtney. Hello, everyone. My name is Courtney Hillier, and I'll be doing the land acknowledgement today. Thank you, Cheryl. So Lawson Health Research Institute and our partners are situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenape, Wendat, and Attawandaron peoples who have long-standing relationships to the land and region of southwestern Ontario and the City of London. The local First Nation communities of this area include Chippewa, Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. In the region, there are 11 First Nation communities and a growing Indigenous urban population. We acknowledge both the historical and ongoing injustices faced by the Indigenous community in Canada and commit to actively listening to, learning from, and building relationships with our Indigenous allies. We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the original peoples of Turtle Island, North America. Thank you. And you're gonna put the slides back up.
So we want to uh, first off acknowledge our multiple partners. Um, mentioned Lawson as the research arm of the London Hospitals, which is both St. Joseph's uh, and London Health Science Center. Uh, but we have numerous other uh, partners involved. And one of the things I hope you'll realize when we talk about how far we came in a very short time with the study is how this would truly be not possible without these strong partnerships. Uh, and, and we thank them. They were very much um, there for us at a difficult time that they were experiencing, as well as our need uh, to get things going quickly. And in the red box at the bottom, the big part of the announcement is that we did get research funding from Health Canada. Canada uh, to, for this four-year um, project uh, to look at this extremely important issue. Uh, as well, uh, Michael and I are the PIs, the principal investigators on this team, the lead researchers, but we have many, many other people involved in terms of other researchers uh, and an advisory group uh, that has very wide representation. Um, the complexity of the issue is really why we need so many people involved. So, we know that harm reduction um, is an evidence-based strategy that has been used in the community uh, for some time, but it's very complex, the issue of using harm reduction strategies in hospitals. We do see some examples of this, um, but it is not it, it's not an easy thing to do, and we'll get into some of those constraints, which, which in, include uh, legal con constraints as to what can happen. Um, I'm throwing this in as a teaser about the greater risk of infection when in hospital, and uh, when you, we hear later uh, from Michael, we'll delve into this in much more detail. So what we're looking at overall in the study, if, if can, can we improve hospital care by bringing in harm reduction strategies, promote people's involvement in their own care, meet needs and reduce adverse health, health outcomes and reduce uh, some of the needs for services overall. So with this four year study, um, and I know all of us have really struggled uh, during this pandemic period. We are, our fiscal years start on April 1st. Well, I, uh, and so I think you all know what, what April 1st, 2020 was like. Uh, and certainly at the university, um, new grants were not even being looked at for, for research ethics. And so our plan for year one was to interview people with the lived experience of both using methamphetamines and um, accessing hospital services as well as healthcare workers. Um, the, uh, which as I say, we, it, it was um, so somewhat delayed, shall we say, because of the pandemic and that delay. But with our help of our community partners, we actually have met uh, that goal by March 31st, and we even have some very initial results, but given that uh, we ended up with about four months uh, to complete what we'd originally hoped would be 12 months worth of work. We've also heard from some of our healthcare providers. Uh, the, the idea that we were able to do this at all, again, speaks uh, to those partnerships. We also wanted to look at how we could identify people um, in terms of earlier inter intervention, and Michael will speak more to that. The reason we wanna to talk to people with lived experience and healthcare providers is one of the basic tenets of harm reduction is you take people where they're at and with what, what they feel they need at that time. So we could sit back and get, say, oh, well in the community harm reduction involves safe consumption sites or or new needles or whatever else we come up with. But we felt it was very important to start this journey with asking people who themselves have these experiences and say, what does harm, what do you want if you were in hospital um, in, in this situation? What, what would you suggest? 
Uh, and that's why year one was really about getting that, that information from people. Uh, year two, which is where we are just started now, uh, is around then collectively identifying from this data what harm reduction strategies we need to develop and implement. Um, implementing that initially in some pilot areas, not assuming we're going to get it 100% right. So in year three, interviewing people and see how can we further improve that, uh, which will then take it uh, to a wider spread and scale in year four, based on the improvements we're hearing from people. And so across the whole study, um, the multiple years, that means up to 360 people who have past or current lived experience of methamphetamine use and services from hospital. And uh, once we have an intervention, obviously we wanna hear from the people accessing that and the healthcare providers as well. Uh, in we used mixed methods, uh, which has been a combination this year of in-person virtual phone interviews, any way we can uh, get a hold of people safely uh, in a pandemic. Um, our, uh, our, in terms of our data from healthcare and service pro providers, th those have all been virtual. Uh, and so despite that short time frame, we do have some findings. One of our really important things we wanted to do was have as much diversity in the sample as possible so that we could tease out not only um, what people were suggesting, what might work, but also to have an idea of who it might not work for. Uh, and to do that, we needed a lot of diversity. And, and uh, we were very, um, and, and so by diversity, in terms of gender, in terms of racial and ethnic background, uh, in terms of currently using uh, versus, uh, versus not, uh, not using, seeing themselves in recovery, uh, age range. So uh, you could see that diversity also, uh, looking at the kinds of diagnoses that people had. Um, you can see with those mental health diagnoses, it adds up to more than, um, than 112. And that's because many people reported multiple diagnoses and also a lot of um, physical health conditions as well. Housing status was also uh, something that we were looking at. I, I did mention uh, that a lot of my previous work has involved issues related to housing and homelessness. And so often we hear a very complex relationship uh, between homelessness and substance use. Some people become uh, describe having become homeless after substance use, and some it's quite opposite. Uh, that people were homeless and then to cope with that experience began using substances and then interweave with both are, are often stories of trauma and abuse. Um, so we, we wanted to look at this issue in our sample. So you can see that although only 58 were currently homeless and you can see the wide range of other housing arrangements that all but two of them at some point uh, had been homeless. Uh, so uh, again, shows this complex relationship. Uh, so you can see, because uh, I said we wanted people who are currently using, uh, as well as people at different points of that, that journey, to again get the different per, uh, perspectives. So uh, 85 of the people were still currently using, and you can see as well about other substance use, uh, 51 using methamphetamine daily. Uh, and Interestingly as well, the discussion of people using um, substances during a hospitalization. So in terms of uh, hospital services, some people accessed inpatient programs, some emergency programs, some outpatient services. Uh, so we were not limiting the sample to people who had been inpatients, but looking at all um, different kinds of uh, connections with the hospital. Uh, and then you can see the uh, tremendous expense on, on uh, average cost per month on substances. 
So um, in terms of hospital use, uh, not expectedly, you can see this is a group that had been accessing a lot of um, healthcare services. Uh, for example, 175 visits to the ER, the ambulance trips, uh, the service providers, uh, phone calls, uh, and the safe consumption site. So what did people say they actually wanted in regards to harm reduction? And pretty much every single person, if not every person, I think it may have been actually every person said, before you do anything about bringing in any kind of harm reduction into um, the hospital, you first must address the issue of stigma discrimination issues. Um, that without doing uh, forms of staff education prior to bringing this in, um, we won't feel safe. We will not feel that harm has been reduced. Uh, that, that part of that also includes addressing uh, knowledge and understanding around substance use, uh, around things like withdrawal, um, uh, and, and other kinds of issues, e um, even under underlying issues of understanding um, substance use addiction as health issues, uh, not moral issues. Um, there was also very specific strategies um, that people talked about. Um, they did talk about the need for uh, a safe injection site and a safe space. And uh, again, I'm giving a high level overview. They, there was descriptions of what that should look like. Um, the access to new needles, syringes, um, uh, sharp boxes, like something fairly basic um, that they found was frequently not available uh, to them uh, in terms of safety. Uh, to understand detox and withdrawal and have the ability to safely detox while in hospital and to be able to have open conversations about that, uh, medication support, access to counseling, and very important, and I think you'll he hear this likely later, uh, I know from our safe consumption site, we hear a lot about the importance of peer support. And certainly our 112 people said that part of what would help them feel safe is also this availability of peer support. Uh, in terms of the staff, uh, what did they say? Um, staff talked about the importance of seeing hospital services as part of a continuum of care uh, and connecting to those community sources and discharge pl um, plans. Uh, they felt that whatever we do should not be based on, a, that, that there had to be some drop-in availabilities, a, a very openness versus uh, something that was very highly scheduled or, or appointment-based. And they agreed that education for for staff would be foundational. Um, they felt that potential barriers could be staff buy-in, uh, the resources, and some of those resources include um, identifying a, a hospital space that would be appropriate. Uh, so this is just the beginning of our, our journey. I know many of you will be interested, well, wh what were those differences in gender, uh, racial and ethnic, background, age, recovery versus, not, and, and uh, you can appreciate in four months and 112 interviews and data entry, we, we've done that this first level. Those are questions we still have to answer ourselves. So we, we can't tell you right now the differences between groups, but we will be looking at that very carefully. Um, and oh, this issue on stigma education, uh, just it, it, we heard it so much, it obviously uh, will be a priority. And this idea of preventing adverse events, and Michael will speak more to that, uh, and greater flexibility and involvement, uh, people's involvement in their own care was certainly also highlighted. And again, you'll hear this from other speakers. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, my, uh, Michael Silverman. Dr. Silverman is the Chair Chief of Infectious Diseases at London Health Sciences Centre and St. Joseph's Healthcare in London. He's an Associate Professor of Medicine and Infectious Diseases at Western University and an Associate Scientist at Lawson Health Research Institute with a special interest 
in the study of infections associated with injection uh, drug use. So thank you, Michael. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay, so let's, so infection, I'm gonna talk a little bit, you'll, you'll wonder why an infectious disease physician is talking about this. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about infectious endocarditis, which is um, and, and one of the many syndromes of infection that occur in people who inject drugs. Uh, endocarditis means an infection of the lining of the heart. Typically it's the heart valves that get infected. Um, when people inject, they, uh, it's not, it doesn't tend to be sterile material that they're injecting and these, the bacteria within it can stick to the heart valves as they circulate. And this can lead to clumps of bacteria which can um, break off and, and, and uh, uh, lead to terrible consequences. It's a devastating infection, um, increasing in its prevalence. Um, it has a 33% mortality, um, uh, and it has, and of those who survive, many are left with serious sequelae. Um, there's a high rate of stroke, pieces breaking off and going to the brain. Uh, they can break off and go to the spinal cord and lead to paralysis, heart failure uh, from the valves being damaged. Recurrence is very common. Almost a quarter of them, a quarter of people who have this will get it again because once the valves are damaged, it's easier for this to happen again and again. And often people need cardiac surgery to fix the valve damage that occurs with the infection. Next slide. So we looked at the experience here in London with this um, uh, and we saw very large numbers. So in, when we just looked at first episodes, the first time someone's had it, we had 261 um, uh, uh, people who had their first episode. And um, almost three quarters, 72.5%, used methamphetamine. Um, now, only about 9.2% used methamphetamine alone. Um, um, a large number, almost two thirds, uh, used me methamphetamine with opiates. Opiates alone, similarly, was not that common, was about just over a quarter of patients. So most people are using both um, uh, methamphetamines and opiates, and so teasing out what the impact is of opiates versus methamphetamine is something we're hoping to look at. Um, but it's important to realize people think, well, when someone's admitted to hospital, they stop using. But uh, of course, that's not what actually happens. In go ongoing inpatient in, um, uh, in, uh, intravenous drug use was documented by the physician in almost two thirds of the episode. So many people came in more than once, but uh, 194 over three, out of 309 episodes. And that's uh, almost half the patients. Now I would, 46% of the patients, I would mention that's a lower percentage than Cheryl spoke about when patients are re re discussing this um, in, in a survey. And that's because pay, due to stigma and uh, fear of being rejected, many patients will deny that to their physician, understandably out of fear of, uh, out of, fear of, of, of uh, repercussions. Um, and so, but of those that the physicians knew that they were doing it, al al almost half the physicians knew that this was going on in hospital. And of those, um, almost two thirds were confirmed by urine uh, drug testing that the person was using in hospital. And importantly, 40% of these patients, uh, of all the patients signed out against medical advice. That's where the physician said, I think you need to stay longer. I think you're not well enough yet to go home. But the patient said, I'm having such a bad experience here, or I'm, I'm really, I, I, for other various reasons, I need to leave and left against medical advice. Next slide. So we looked at the issue of bloodstream infections. So bloodstream infections is when you have bacteria in the blood, a new bacteria in the blood. Um, and usually that's because someone injected into their veins while they were in hospital. And then, um, and then the a new bacteria got in and can make you quite sick. Um, and we published this in, in the Journal uh, of, of the American Medical Association um, uh, in 2019. So we, 82 of the 420 episodes, so almost 20% of the time when people were in with this disease, they had a new bloodstream infection while in hospital, which is a very high rate. Um, there were 138 new bloodstream infections. So many people had multiple new bloodstream infections. And uh, almost half of those had multiple different bacteria in the blood when we, when we looked at it. And they tended to be highly resistant organisms requiring aggressive intravenous antibiotic therapy. This is on top of the antibiotics they were getting for their endocarditis. And most of these organisms were associated with the kind of organisms we would see in tap water, 
which is of course not sterile. And it's, we think it's because people were using the water from the tap to dilute the drugs that they were going to that they were going to inject. And of course, since they did not have sterile water in hospital, um, unlike when you were at home, you, you might be able to get this from um, uh, uh, needle services, you, you can get sterile water. In hospital, it was hard for them to get that. Um, and so they were injecting tap water and getting very sick. Next slide. So we looked at, you know, hazard rate, the, the, the likelihood that something bad was going to happen. And being an inpatient, so actually get, being treated for your endocarditis while you're in hospital, you were four and a half times more likely to have one of these than if you uh, one of these infections than if you were at home because at home patients were having access to safer uh, injection materials. Physician documented intravenous drug use again. If the physician said, "I think the person's using," they were five times more likely to happen, likely because the physicians were correct that people were using. Inpatient addiction uh, treatment and addiction counseling was associated with a lower rate. So you're half as likely for this to happen if people uh, were getting counseling in hospital. Um, and factors associated with mortality included being, uh, in, being treated as an inpatient. So if you're an in, in, inpatient, more, they're more likely to succumb. Now, I wanna emphasize, we're not suggesting that people who are in, you know, should not be admitted to hospital and that it's safer to be at home because the people who were staying in hospital often were sicker than those who went home or even signing out against medical advice, you have to be well enough to stand up and sign a piece of paper and walk out the door. Whereas if someone's critically ill in the intensive care unit and, and not able to stand and not able to walk, then they're unlikely to live, leave against medical advice. But what we are saying is that, hot, if, so if people are sick enough to need to stay and the physician recommends them to stay, they should, we're recommending you stay. But what we do wanna do is make hospitals safer and make them a place where people who are going to inject anyway can do it more safely. Um, now, if someone had a peripherally inserted central catheter, what's called a PICC line, um, that was very common that people were injecting into the PICC line because it's easier than finding a vein and almost a quarter of patients, who, uh, the physician documented that we think that the person is injecting into the PICC line, that's probably an underestimate. And, injection, and, and if people who were injecting into the PICC line, they were more likely to get endocarditis again, to relapse. And unfortunately, they were three times more likely to die. Next slide. So how many people were getting addiction counseling? Well, 37% received inpatient addiction counseling. Um, and of, and 30, uh, 39% uh, got, uh, were referred for outpatient addiction counseling, and that's mostly the same people. If they got inpatient counseling, they referred to outpatient counseling. And you could say, well, that's very low. Why did not more people get it? And that's because those services are often not linked. Inpatient care and counseling, often counseling is something that's done in an outpatient setting. And, and London is not special that way. Uh, many studies done across North America have found the same problem in acute care hospitals, that, that counseling in hospital is the exception rather than the rule and most patients don't get it. And we gotta find out how to improve it. Inpatient opiate prescribing, so getting some opiates to try to prevent opiate withdrawal was common. So uh, almost 96% of people got it, but unfortunately we don't have drugs that can help prevent withdrawal from methamphetamines. Next slide. So what are our outstanding questions? What do we wanna study? How can we improve the experience so patients don't, sign, don't feel the need to sign out against medical advice and so they can get the care they feel they need? And how do we improve referral and retention in counseling? How do we get that to, to happen in, in an acute care setting? Can we get harm reduction materials into the hospital, just like there's been so much effort to get it in the community? What's been the impact of lockdowns? Um, and uh, associated with COVID on admissions for medical and psychiatric complications. We're worried there's less harm reduction programs in the community and is that making more people get admitted? What about the many other medical complications? I was just talking about endocarditis, but there are many infections that occur when you in inject non-sterile material into the veins. It can, the, the bacteria can settle in the bones and cause what's called osteomyelitis, infection of the bones, septic arthritis, infections of the joints, serious lung infections, cerebral abscesses or abscesses within the brain, epidural abscess, uh, uh, which is uh, along the lining around the spinal cord, which can lead to paraplegia or quadriplegia, skin abscesses, and many other infectious complications. 
how do methamphetamines impact these diseases versus opiates? Because almost all the studies have been around opiates, um, but methamphetamine use has been increasing. And it, for instance, we know methamphetamine causes more left-sided endocarditis, uh, of, uh, infections on the left side of the heart, and that's more lethal. Uh, next slide. And how are we gonna try to answer this? And, and, and Dr. Forchuk talked about combination approaches of interview, uh, interviews, uh, particularly of patients and staff. And we also wanna look at ICES databases. So the, data, the administrative databases of uh, OHIP, et cetera, that help us to see what's happening around on, across Ontario, not just in London, and, and get an idea of how, how broadly these, prob uh, these, broad these problems are, are, are spread and get ideas as to how we can solve them. So um, uh, at that, I'm going to um, take the great pleasure to introduce Sonia Burke. She's a Director of Harm Reduction at the Regional HIV AIDS Connection. Uh, Sonia has worked in harm reduction for over nine years, supporting one of the busiest needle syringe programs in Ontario, as well as outreach programs and services. She was instrumental in the launch of the first ministry-funded temporary overdose prevention site in Ontario which transitioned to permanent services through care point, consumption and treatment services. She supported the expansion of harm reduction services to include mobile outreach to Oxford and Elgin counties, indigenous harm reduction, incorporating traditional and Western approaches and wraparound supports to people who use substances through multiple community partnerships and integration of service models. And she's a great resource for our community that we're proud to have. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm here to talk about uh, CarePoint and let you know that what we have seen in our community. So we have had over 54,000 visits from people who use substances in just over two years. And we are seeing people with more and more complex healthcare needs. What we know is there is a number of deaths uh, of people experiencing addiction and homeless continues to be, to, to be high. Many of these deaths are connected to our existing opioid crisis. However, we want to highlight that based on the complex healthcare needs and concerns that are presenting, we know that this rate of death is much more complex and it's much deeper. People are presenting at CarePoint with multiple conditions, including abscesses, infections, broken bones, open wounds, many that have gone untreated for weeks, months, or years. Although we refer for further medical care, it, <clears throat> sorry, it can take a long time for a person to, to agree to go, even though the symptoms continue to worsen. Instead of asking what is wrong with the person, we need to ask ourselves what is wrong with the service delivery model. When a person does agree to seek care, they return <clears throat> to us having left hospital often against medical advice, as Michael has indicated. Their experiences reflect stigma, biases, and assumptions about them and their substance use. People who use substances are capable of engaging in their own health care. Substance use does not define a person. People are not all one thing. They are complex, they are multifaceted with their own experiences. In the hospital setting, as designed, it does not provide the opportunity for people who use substances to engage in their own care. It does not meet people where they're at. It does not recognize the complexity of addiction and homelessness. Our experiences in CarePoint Supervised Consumption Services, which is a harm reduction strategy, demonstrates when given the opportunity to use substance with acceptance and without judgment, builds trust and demonstrates the belief that the person actually matters. It demonstrates that people can and will engage in their own health care. It demonstrates that harm reduction in a healthcare setting works. When we remove the harms associated with substance use, including systematic barriers, it saves lives. And we know and have demonstrated through evidence, integrating harm reduction supports in healthcare settings saves lives. Now, I would like to take this opportunity. I'm very lucky to be able to introduce Dave Lefave. Sorry, I said it wrong and I knew I was gonna do it. Dave Lefave is a person with experience who has been involved with and supports people who use substances for over 19 years. 
He is a harm reduction worker here at Regional HIV AIDS Connection and has worked in, in detox as peer support. His combined experience with substance use and system barriers makes him an expert on the changes that we need to see. I'm Dave. Um, the, the stigma of the word addict as a negative is one word that sticks within the healthcare system. Um, in my experience over the years, it's been ongoing. Addicts are med seeking, are treated less than, and pushed through quicker to get them out of the way, a nuisance. They left earlier against doctor's orders because they were not left. They were left not knowing what was happening, scared and feeling like they didn't matter. When you feel you don't matter, this kind of feeling is magnified more when it's in a hospital and you are in need of some serious if infections get worse, bones, bone breaks don't heal properly and your health doesn't improve. It starts, spir uh, it starts spiraling lower. I mean, why go? Nothing will really get done anyways. I'll get, I'll get treated like a pariah and be pushed aside or rushed through because everything I say is a lie. Where it is easy for most to make that choice to go, I have now to add all these feelings to my already fearful idea of what will inevitably happen because it always does. To have someone to represent, have a voice of truth that will be believed is what I believe is half the battle. Harm reduction, Harm reduction as part of the process of substance users accessing healthcare would alleviate that tension. Anxiety that stops us from going to the place that there should be safe, somewhere safe and feel like we matter because we do. Meeting us where we are at allows us to feel that we are part of, not apart from, being treated as human first, not our problem first, makes all the differences in how we perceive ourselves. In a world where we are looked down upon, advocacy and some representation that we have fundamental right, a fundamental right to healthcare and and treated like so will happen when harm reduction workers are the medium between the patient and the healthcare and healthcare because someone they trust is there working with them to get their health needs met. The stress will be somewhat lessened, visits would be less, and in my eyes, it's a win-win for everyone involved. So um, we're now at the question period. And to ask your question, go to the question and answer chat window. Uh, it's in that black toolbar uh, bar at the bottom. Uh, if you can direct who you want to uh, direct the question to, uh, myself, Cheryl, Michael, Dave, Sonia, everyone, uh, that will help. And as I said, given the number of people, I already see 10 questions in the box. We're counting on our staff, uh, particularly uh, John, you can see showing up here now, uh, our research coordinator uh, and our other staff, Courtney and Sarah, are also keeping an eye on that. Uh, and we'll count on uh, our staff to ask us those questions from the group. Yeah, I can make a start. Um, there was a couple of questions on pick lines. So that'd be for you, Mike. Uh, the first question was, <clears throat> were dual pick lines considered as a harm reduction strategy? And the second question is, has teaching around pick line use been considered? Well, those are very good questions. So there are a number of potential harm reduction strategies that could be used. So. Um, now, people talk about the dual pick line. That's where there's two accesses, one for the antibiotics that we're treating and a second one so people can reach the second one. One of the fundamental problems we're dealing with, however, is even if we treat proper, uh, if, if we teach proper access technique, the substance that's being injected is non-sterile. So unless we can get harm reduction materials and sterile fluids um, to inject in, um, then the best technique will still lead to the pick line being infected. So we have to look at how we can get um, 
more uh, sterile materials to be injected because even if someone's washing their hands and putting alcohol on the line before they inject into it, if the stuff they're putting in is tap water, that, that will infect the pick line. So we do have to look at, at techniques. One of the best things would be if people had sterile materials to inject. Now in the community, people are injecting into their veins, not into a pick line. And the, and if they're injecting sterile water that was given by the by harm reduction services, that makes it safer. If they're crushing a tablet, of course, the tablet is not sterile. And often the materials they're using for crushing are not sterile. Now that's how you can get endocarditis. That's how you can get infections in the brain. But if you're injecting into a piece of plastic, like an IV line, many of these bacteria that are in water stick extremely well to plastic. And so, um, it's very easy for that line to get infected. And if your valve is already damaged by endocarditis, by, by other bacteria, then now those new bacteria you've injected can stick to this damaged valve more easily. So we need to look at how we can do it. And, and teaching techniques would be helpful. Um, and, and I think that's, that, that's very worthwhile of, of thinking about. Dual lines could be considered, but really I think the most important thing is can we find ways where people can get sterile materials uh, in addition to those two other things that were suggested to inject? And can we find ways where the system can be changed such that people can be given harm reduction materials? And that will require a change in, in law to some extent, but also a change in culture in the hospitals. Thanks so much, Mike. So we have a question. Um, I think this will be good for Dr. Forchuk. Mm -hmm. So from Letitia here, what is being done to support peers as a valid support in hospitals and encourage their presence? And why in a healthcare facility is there no access to sterile to tools to complete an injection in a sterile manner? Yeah. Uh, again, excellent questions, um, and it, it's very interesting. I, I can do studies in very diverse areas, and the issue of peer support comes up over and over again. Uh, in some of our programs, we do have peer support available. Uh, for example, where we have the transitional um, discharge model and we have uh, peer supports in terms of people with lived experience of different mental health challenges. Uh, but what people were asking for in this context from this data was a different kind of um, peer support. So given uh, what because we're trying to build something that is what people are asking for, we, we are certainly looking at that. We, we do have some peer support available um, at the hospital uh, for people um, uh, who uh, have addiction related needs, but it tends to be more focused on, this, on the psychiatric and mental health programs. And I don't think we've adequately looked at this at all for our medical programs. Uh, so, and, and what we're looking at is how do we change Again, although we'll be starting on some pilot areas, uh, we need to look at how to more broadly bring this in. So we, it's not that there's none available. I would say it's that there's not enough available and that um, we need to rethink um, uh, how that goes and also who a peer actually is. Because it, again, in the different context, who a peer is can be quite different. And I, I would like to also throw that question to uh, Dave, because Dave is very in, involved in peer support, if you don't mind, Dave. Cheryl, can you just repeat the question in regards to peer support component? I'll, I'll ask Courtney in, in case I miss misquote. <laughs> Could you reread the question, Courtney? Sorry, I was having technical difficulties unmuting myself. <laughs> so uh, what is being done to support peers as a valid support in hospitals and encourage their presence? So with, you may have to say what should happen, Dave. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's kind of a loaded question in the in that capacity. 
I think Dave can, maybe you can speak to what kind of peer supports you know are happening in community and how some of those community agencies support within hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I like think I, that's what's I, happening. I, yeah. Yeah. I believe London Cares um, is called quite frequently at both the places I've worked to, because uh, they won't go alone. They, they get a, a peer to go with them so they don't get treated a certain way. Mm -hmm. Which is always negative. Yeah. Why they won't go in the first place? In your community, mm -hmm. in your community too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you know, I think what Dave is really reflecting is that the community relies on the you know each other, and they rely on the community agencies that are doing outreach, and that really, to be honest, is gets. I can't speak to what happens within the hospital. I'm only supporting Dave here with the idea that they won't even go to the, the, the hospital front doors. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that, and I'm not speaking for everyone, we're just, you know, reflecting that these are different experiences. The idea is they need, the peer supports are engaged where available within the community to get to that triage location. And, um, yeah. and, and those decisions to go usually take weeks or months because the trust isn't there. Yeah, and 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 again, we do have some. Uh, I was thinking as well. CMHA is another program that offers peer support, and and will have people as well in the ER. Um, but uh, again, I think we, uh, even though there's some peer support, uh, clearly it's not enough support, and we have to rethink on how it offers. And I can say too, even my research staff um, have at times had to accompany. Uh, someone to hospital in need of medical support to be an advocate, and and that and that's certain. Sometimes that's a peer, and sometimes it's not. Um, but be you know, and sometimes that's been because they had a broken arm, for example. Uh, but because uh, they didn't feel safe uh, going because uh, that they were concerned, even with a broken arm, they might be accused of drug-seeking behavior. Um, next question. Uh, yeah, um, I also want to say there's a lot of appreciation for Dave in the comments. So again, thank you, Dave, for sharing your experiences. Uh, an interesting question here, I think, for Dr. Michael Silverman uh, from Kirsten. Why would methamphetamine injection be more commonly associated with left-sided endo endocarditis than opiates? Uh, that's a wonderful question. So. Um, it, it's generally been assumed that if someone injects and it's non-sterile, that's all we need to know. And that it doesn't matter what substance people inject, it's the fact, it's the simple fact of injecting. And actually, you know, this is something we've been looking into aggressively and, and we have found no, that, that's not, what people are injecting also has a big impact. We've recently looked at, not all opiates are the same. So we showed that, uh, we published recently, um, that hydromorphone controlled release is associated with a much higher rate of endocarditis than if you're than if you're injecting any other opiate because actually substances that make it slow release actually help bacteria grow and make it more dangerous uh, when you inject that for your heart similarly um, you know the uh, uh, the issue of methamphetamines versus other opiates so it, it looks like actual that opiates can affect certain receptors that are actually on the heart valves and that they can make bacteria stick to heart valves better. And because a larger concentration of the opiate hits the right side of your heart first, um, and then it gets diluted as the longer it's in your bloodstream. And so by the time it hits the left side of the heart, there's less of it around. It may make bacteria stick to the right heart of the right side of the heart it's called the, the, the typically that what's called the tricuspid valve more effectively and so that valve gets infected preferentially with right with opiates and with but amphet, uh, amphetamines uh, cause constriction vasoconstriction of the left side of the heart and uh, uh, and of the arteries that lead to that and change the dynamics of blood flow and can make the left side um, involved. So what people are injecting can, can can affect things. And as opiates, we have better. We're, we're getting better control now. We don't clearly the opiate epidemic is nowhere near under control, but amphetamine use has been increasing, and uh, uh, methamphetamine use in particular. 
Um, and, uh, and therefore we need to understand these various drugs if we're gonna be able to control what's happening and uh, just lumping everything together and saying it's all injection drug use, we can miss some of what's actually happening and how we can intervene. Perfect, thank you, Michael. So we've got a, another um, couple of questions for you, Mike. <laughs> um, this is surrounding actually prescribing people things that will help um, manage withdrawal symptoms from methamphetamine. So from Tahira here, we've got, I've seen dexedrine been described or prescribed of methamphetamine dependence. And is there any evidence that this might work for some folks? And just another um, question regarding um, anything about safe prescribing for methamphetamine dependence from Kathy. So um, th these, these are more excellent questions. So what, what I would say is it's a subject of active investigation. So, um, well, butrin, you know, has been studied and has shown some benefit at reducing craving for methamphetamine. Um, these are very recent studies, uh, and um, uh, there there are concerns that you know could this, uh, could, you know, because some people will inject uh, uh, th th those drugs as well as not just take them by mouth. And so those studies are ongoing. Dexedrine has been hypothesized as well. Um, and I think those are very important things that need to be looked at. Um, now that's beyond the scope of this study, which is looking at how can we make it, you know, but it's an important, those are important studies to be done. What they would need to be able to answer those are what's called randomized control trials, where at random half of the people get a certain drug and, see, and half get a placebo and see if they're less likely to uh, use a, me a methamphetamine either by uh, or or oral or inhalation or by injection versus those who got placebo. Those, those trials are planned from my understanding and, and, and those are um, hope, hopefully will, will happen soon. Preliminary results suggest some benefit again for the Wellbutrin particularly, but um, I think more studies need to be done before these are rolled out because there are potential harms um, with, these, with these agents as well. Um, but I think they're very important that we study that further and, and, and get to the bottom of that because we desperately need harm, better harm reduction strategies for um, methamphetamines. Perfect, thank you. So um, we are coming up on about seven minutes until 11 o'clock. So um, we have a question that's being tabled to all participants. And I think this would be a good one to end off on. So um, from Patty here, do you have any strategies to suggest when staff engagement or uptake around the harm reduction practices are low or you are experiencing significant pushback? Um, I'll, I'll start with that uh, because as, as you heard from the data, uh, the interviews we've had with staff, uh, staff have concerns uh, and, and often the staff that would agree to participate on the focus groups are, are more motivated staff. Uh, and certainly what we heard from the people, with the 112 people we interviewed with the lived experience, they anticipate that will be one of the biggest but most important issues. Um, so we certainly anticipate that one of our strategies is going to be to look at a couple of units, probably a mental health unit and a medical unit uh, to start with uh, and to look at refining those strategies. We do know there's been a lot of work at how, on how you reduce stigma. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good evidence about the proper approaches. For example, and it goes back to what we're saying, similar to the peer support is hearing from people with lived experience and knowing someone is one of the best ways um, to get past stigma and have it stick. Uh, ver versus something that's a, a more academic, like do a, an online teaching module on how you shouldn't be, uh, it, it's much, much more important. 
uh, to, to see the face, to understand um, that from someone who's experienced it. And so the collaborative participatory approaches that we will be using, including people with lived experience, uh, we think will be an important strategy. Uh, but I think that should go to the others. And maybe in the interest of times, so I don't know if, uh, again, I don't want to put Dave and Sonia on the spot, but um, if you have ideas on that, because I know both of you have a lot of experience with these issues. And you're on mute here. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Courtney, can you do the question again? Sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry. Here we go. So. I know, I'm scrolling through here. <laughs> um, so, goodness, where is it? Um, essentially, we're asking about um, how we can manage any pushback from staff or trying to get mm. staff to uptake harm reduction practices um, and how we can manage that. Um. So, you know, I think it's important to recognize that, again, the experience for staff is multifaceted as well. And so it, it really is about asking the questions. And, you know, it's not doing on to staff or it's about understanding truly what the concerns are, what the question, be open minded to hear and understand how multifaceted healthcare is and, um, you know, there are lots of things that have to be managed. So it's actually, to me, it's a conversation with staff. It's not a conversation at staff. And understanding um, stigma, internal bias, those kinds of things are, it, it's very challenging because you are conditioned and you understand what you understand and you know what you know. You don't know what you don't know. So it, it, it's, it's, um, it's very uh, difficult to unpack, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I don't ever want to paint the picture in my head that staff are bad people and they just don't understand. It's actually about uh, a willingness to hear more information, an openness to learn. And the only way we can really effectively change that is, it's not just about hospital staff, it's our education system, it's training that people are receiving, it's exposure, it's, you know, there, it's much bigger. So I know maybe I haven't answered the question directly, but I think what we need to do is come at it with a spirit of generosity, which people who are working in hospitals are working because they want to better support people's health care. That is their true intention, why they're there, and we need to respect that. And then we need to unpack what are some of the things that might be stopping us stepping out of what we've been trained and what we've been conditioned to believe to see things from a totally different perspective. So you know, I think it's a complex process. I think it's going to take time. I think that it's an engagement with staff to understand what are the concerns, you know, and, and the idea too is come and see working in action in a supervised consumption site, because it is possible. And I've often had people say to me, I don't see how it can work. Like it's just, it's beyond my comprehension. So to have a visit to come and see how it actually can work um, is something, you know, that maybe we can offer. I, I just, I think the my point is and uh, that it's the opportunities are there. We just need to come to the table respectfully and have those conversations. And I guarantee you there will be difficult conversations and that's okay. That's what makes the idea of this great. Uh, is it stepping out of a box that we have been in for way too long? I would just add that, you know, from the staff's point of view, it's important to realize where some of this is coming from and some is stigma. But you have to understand some of the pressures the staff are under. So there's a huge quality improvement program that's gone on across North America to reduce the rate of infections associated with intravenous lines. And this is a performance indicator for the hospital. The higher the rates those are, the hospital is deemed as being a bad hospital. So when the staff, there are so many projects to keep these lines sterile and to reduce that rate, and they have to report those rates. And then they come in and see someone injecting non-sterile material into it that they know is gonna reflect badly on them, suggesting that their processes are bad. 
and it's going to be publicly released. They understand we are saying, wait a minute, you're making me look bad. And, and we have to stop this because otherwise there's going to be negative repercussions to me. Also for your health, I'm trying to keep you healthy and to reduce infections in you. And you're doing something that I see puts you at risk. And so they feel like they've got to stop the person. And so we get into this conflictual thing. And it's not just the staff. Most patients do not have single bed rooms because we have shortages. Often they're responding to pa other patients in the room complaining, I saw that person inject into their line, get them out of here. And, and, they ha and we have to deal with community uh, stigma related to this. And, and that's one reason why forums like this to try to help educate the community is important. Also because it's not, we, the, the, we don't have those harm reduction techniques here, like a safe place to put the needles for the, for the patients, then patients feel they have to do this in secret. And so then they're hiding needles. And then you have staff reaching into the bed to try to help clean things and then getting a needle poke, getting very upset. So we have to bring in harm reduction. We have to bring in education. We have to, we have to increase the understanding that these things happen and try to take away some of these performance indicators that can punish staff for being understanding. There has to be a whole system change if we want to get rid of some of this stigma and the way people are being treated, because otherwise you get into these conflicts and patients go, I just want to get out of here because the staff is getting mad at me. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we are essentially at time now. So unless anyone has any further I endpoints. I, I was just wondering if, like, I know Dave didn't get a chance to answer that last question, even though we're one minute over. I didn't know if he wanted to. Uh, he chose to abstain. Okay, all right, then we're all good. <laughs> well, you, Dave, you go, Sonia. I think that was the answer. <laughs> And I think um, as well, uh, we, we've got the contact information if people would like to follow up with us. I, I hope one of the kind of meta messages, like the, these are not easy conversations. These are, there's, these are, we're, the, there's not silver bullets, but, uh, but it is about working together. Um, and we very much see this as a participatory approach and working together and learning from each other and not assuming we have the right answers. Uh, even with that preliminary data that we, um, uh, you know, that, that we have, it still is pre preliminary. We have to dive much deeper into that uh, data that we, we have just so recently uh, finished collecting and look uh, particularly at subgroups. We can't assume that the subgroups within that um, all believe the same thing. There, there, there's likely going to be differences. And I would thank all of you. The amount of participation today um, underscores the importance of the issue uh, and that it is an issue that we all need uh, to address. Um, I will direct any press to Laura's contact there at Lawson if you need to follow up with us. Uh, for any um, media information. And just thank you uh, for coming out today. Thank you to the staff uh, who've made, uh, who've worked hard to make this happen. Uh, and we'll just say goodbye. Um.